Good morning, Grace Place family. We are going to read a couple of passages, actually three. You want to turn in Luke uh, chapter 2. Save your place in Luke chapter 2. We're going to do a reading from there. We'll do a reading from John chapter 14. Luke chapter 2, John chapter 14, and then finally from Romans chapter 15. We're talking about the God of peace. Advent Sunday 2. Lighting the candle of peace. Luke chapter 2, John chapter 14, Romans chapter 15. Everybody there? All right, let's start with Luke chapter 2. There were shepherds camping, or sheep herders camping in the neighborhood. They had set night watches over the sheep, and suddenly... God's angels stood among them, and God's glory blazed around them, and they were terrified, and the angels said, don't be afraid. I'm here to announce a great and joyful event that is meant for everybody worldwide. A Savior has just been born in David's town, a Savior who is Messiah and Master. This is what You're to look for a baby wrapped in a blanket and lying in a manger. At once, the angel joined by a huge angelic choir singing God's praises. Glory to God. Let's let's say this together. Glory to God in the heavenly heights. Peace to all men and women on earth who please him. John chapter 14 beginning at verse 25. I'm telling you these things while I'm still living with you. The friend, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send at my request, will make everything plain to you. He will remind you of all things that I have told you. I am leaving you well and whole. That's my parting gift to you, peace. I don't leave you the way you used to uh, being left, feeling abandoned, bereaved. So don't be upset. Don't be distraught. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Oh, may the God of hope fill you with joy, fill you up with peace, So that your believing lives, filled with the life-giving energy of the Holy Spirit, will brim over with hope. Blogger Sarah Betsy uh, said in respect to Advent Week 2, peace, she said, I believe that peacemaking is more in step with Jesus than peacekeeping. I believe that peacemaking is more in step with Jesus than peacemaking. I love that. And I believe it too. What does peace really look like? Is it keeping our friends on social media friendly? (laughs) Covering over things, hiding things, just trying to stay in neutral? Peacekeepers versus peacemakers. There's a huge difference. Early in ministry, I thought that my job was to get everybody to like me, to bring everybody around in agreement with um, you know, uh, each other, and that that was my role, was to try to get everybody on the same page. And as a young staff pastor, I was often uh, egregious because we had these different factions and it just seemed like everybody wasn't on the same page and often there were pockets of people in different places that didn't like me and that became my mission was to try to get them to like me. But as I matured and grew up and learned more about leadership, I discovered that we always get really two choices with people with respect to leadership. You can either get people to like you or you can get people to respect you. 
and you have to make the choice. And so ultimately, I started uh, down a path of trying to just get people to respect me, understanding that there were going to be days they didn't like me. There were going to be instances and times that they didn't like me, but I felt like we could lead the team. We could lead uh, an effort to evangelize. We could lead an effort to do something powerful for God if we just had the respect of everyone. Though they might not personally like you, personality clashes or whatever, they believe in the vision. They believe in, in, in where you're going and, and where God is leading and what God is saying and what God is doing. And they're willing to, to come together for the purposes of that mission and that vision. Jesus said in uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 through 39, Something that's very unpeace like. I want to read it to you. Jesus said, Don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. I have come to set men against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter in law against her mother in law. Your enemies will be right in your own household. If you love your father or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or your daughter more than me, you're not worthy of being mine. If you you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. In this passage, Jesus clearly identified that there is a difference between peacekeeping and peacemaking. Peacekeepers will sell, trade, or change biblical values for household ceasefire agreements. They're willing to do anything to get everybody to calm down. And that's the way they see peace, is that if if we're not talking about these things that disrupt, if we're not talking about areas of disagreement, if we're not uh, focusing on things like this, then we have peace in our household. And that's what peacekeepers do. And by and large, that's what's going on in our culture at large right now, is that there's attempts to try to keep the peace. But peacemakers are very different. Peacemakers carry the sword into the family living room, even if it means they are going to be the sacrifice. Jesus comes to the table and he says to mankind, I am God. Throw up your surrender flags and we'll, I'll tell you what the terms are <laughs> for your full and unconditional surrender. Mankind says, come to the table, God. Uh, we don't want commandment one, commandment three, commandment five, and commandment seven. And we're okay with doing some of those others. Uh, let's put commandment ten on pause. All right. God says... It's my table, it's my world, (laughs) it's my universe. I would accept your full and unconditional surrender. It's a struggle for us to understand peace on those terms because we're living in a peacekeeping generation. We believe that our role is to separate disputes, identify points of agreement. And there's a reason that we are so bad at outer peace and that is because we are We are even worse at inner peace, right? Our outer unrest is a symptom of a deeper problem inside of us. We are uh, not at rest inside of us. The monk Thomas Merton wrote uh, this. He said, we are not at peace with others because we are not at peace with ourselves. And we are not at peace with ourselves because we are not at peace with God. We open by reading from the passage, a Savior has just been born in David's town, a Savior who's Messiah and Master. 
And that is what you are to look for, a baby wrapped in a blanket, lying in a manger. At once the angels joined in a huge angelic choir, singing God's praises. And they were basically saying, here's the gospel capsulized for you. Glory to God in the heavenly heights, peace to all men uh, and women on earth who please him. Who please him. It's his table. It's his planet. It's his universe. Peace is what God announced at the birth of God. Peace. I'm coming to let you know what the terms for peace are. How there can be a peace inside of you, even when there are, there are things raging around you that seem out of control. How there can be a calmness that goes on inside of you, a stability that will carry you through the rest of your life. Here's the place of surrender. I believe that we will see swords beaten to plowshares, but it won't happen by magic, poof. Instead, it will be because we've realized that it's us. We are the peacekeepers rather than the peacemakers. It is us that needs to go to the table and make peace with God. It is a time to get the good work of, of following Jesus embodying the peace that we have found in him by making a full and a complete surrender. The good news for the shepherds was that the peace was available for all who please him. Everyone who would obey him and follow him. The difference we've talked about often over the course of this year between being a fan of Jesus and really liking what Jesus did and what he accomplished. Just truly being a fan of him, like you might be a fan of Gandhi or some other great historical figure, and just saying, that's awesome. That's probably a better way to live. That's, that's neat what Jesus did. And moving across the line and saying, now I am going to follow and obey him. I'm going to be his disciple. There's a difference. It's huge. There are many in the world who are fans of Jesus, but they have not made peace with God. They haven't crossed the line because they still have some things that they want to control. They still have some outcomes that they want to be uh, in control of. They still have some, some uh, agenda in their own minds and in their own hearts and own life. And, and so they are saying, yeah, you know, it's probably a good thing to hang out around Christianity. That's probably where I lean more than other things. But, you know, this guy has a good point and that guy has a good point. And, and God's sitting there going, come on, <laughs> it's time to surrender. If you really want to know what peace is all about, it's time to surrender. John chapter 14, I'm telling you, chapter 14 beginning at verse 25, we read it a moment ago, I'm telling you these things while I am still living with you. The friend of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send at my request, will make everything plain to you. He will remind you of all things that I have told you. I am leaving you well and whole. That's my parting gift to you, peace. Man, man, this is, get our minds around, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's, he's getting ready um, to go through everything that he's, that, he's, that he's going to have to go through at the cross. He is, uh, after that, going to appear to them and ascend up into heaven. And he just wants to remind them as that, you know, here is what you have now that you didn't have before. Right. A peace. Yes. You thought you knew what peace was. It was getting the neighborhood quiet. <laughs> you thought you knew what peace was. And it was just getting the kids to stop fighting over what television show they were watching. You thought you understood what peace was all about. It's just like, you know, I'm not going to respond to, to uh, Aunt So-and-So's uh, post on social media because... You know, that's just going to like, it's going to be a whole warfare going on. And, and you thought you understood what peace was all about. But, but you now know peace. Yeah. The peace of God that passes all understanding. And I just want to remind you of that. He says, that's my parting gift to you, peace. It was the opening gift, peace. And it's my parting gift, peace, to you. Yeah. 
I don't leave you the way that you used to be, uh, and you used to be feel, feeling left, feeling abandoned, bereft, bereft. Uh, so don't be upset. Don't be distraught. And the question for us this morning is, do we know the Prince of Peace? Peace is what Jesus left with us. I believe that Advent reminds me that peace was announced, and then peace was promised, and then peace is our birthright, it's the end game, and our wholeness at last in his presence. It's what's referred to often as the rest of the Lord. That's what it's all about, is to have that deep, abiding inner peace that regardless of what's going on around us, we have a calm and a peace to know and to trust that God is going to bring us through, that we're going to be with Him. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Oh, may the God of hope fill you up with joy, fill you up with peace, so that, the, so that your believing lives, filled with life-giving energy of the Holy Spirit, will brim over with hope. What kind of life is a life without peace? What does it look like? It's a life that is never satiated. It's a life that's never satisfied. It's a life that is never fulfilled. A life without peace always has a, if I only had that. What I'm missing is this. If I only had more money, if I only had a better relationship, if I only had, uh, you know, that title, if I only had, you know, uh, whatever it might be, there's, there's that emptiness, that's the, the inability to be satiated by anything that's going on and to truly be satisfied. These moments that you feel like uh, that's good and then it goes away. It's like getting on a high and, it, and, and then it goes away and you have this emptiness. You need to fill it with something else. You keep trying to plug things into it. It's because there is no inner peace and we can never be satisfied and satiated in the things that we have. Michelle and I were on the drive home uh, last night and we were just kind of saying to one another, man, how God has blessed our lives as we looked back over the long track record, not just today or last week or last month, but the 35 years that we've been married and we look back and see how God has blessed us. Yes, there have been trials. Yes, there have been challenges. Yes, there have been tests in our marriage and, and all kinds of manners of things that happen in anyone else's life. But oh, as we look back, how satisfied we have always been because that peace has been on the throne of our heart. Because the God of peace has been ruling inside of us. And so whatever the storm raged and, and whenever we thought there was challenges and difficulties that, that we might not be able to get through, we had this anchor down inside of us that said, I'm here and I'm bringing you through it. Amen. What does a life without peace look like? It's a, it's a life we talked about last week that's like leaning on cobwebs. Bill Dad was talking to Job and he said, you know, there's, the, your hope is a, is a hope that's like leaning on a cobweb. It's not substantial. It's not going to hold you. It's not going to keep you up. And though there are be there's beauty in the cobwebs, and they serve their purpose. We talked about it last week. It, its purpose is it's a ladder. It's a ladder for, for the one who built it. And it's a trap for its victim. And he said, your, your life without God is, is, is a life that is like leaning on a cobweb. It's not substantial. And what is a life that has no peace like? It is a life that is, has all these unanswered questions, the large questions of life. Who am I? Why am I? Where am I going after this life? And a life that, that has no uh, surrendered peace to God has no answers for that. There is no worldview out there that has an answer for these questions. The substantial, only in Christ do we find an answer to every single one of these questions. Who am I? Why am I? And where am I going when life is over? A life without peace is a life that is unsettled and restless. And people who are living it are always kind of anxious about things and unsettled and, 
and uh, unable to be at, at, at peace and really just calm down and relax in the midst of a storm. Zach was very sick about this time many years back when he was only about nine years old and Michelle and I were facing the, the reality that we may lose him, that he, he may pass away in that hospital and it was the depth of grief that never won any parent to have to experience and we're sitting in the lobby and yet in the midst of that storm came a song. The song that it is well with my soul. A settled calmness that God is in charge. We didn't know in that moment that God would turn the whole thing around. Twelve pastors would step into that room and begin to pray the prayer of faith that God would come and visit. I had reached the point where I would fall over on him and I couldn't even, uh, there were so many tears, I couldn't even muster words to speak to God. We didn't know all of these things were about to happen and that we would be transferred to another hospital, immediately begin to see the transition and the turnaround in his life. We had no idea. We just saw our son slipping away, slipping away. But in that little lobby as we sat together and held each other, we felt the song, it is well, it is well with my soul. I thought about how the one who penned that, H.G. Spafford, I don't know if you know the story of that great hymn and how he penned that song, but he had a business, very successful business in the United States. His family lived in England and he had gone ahead and, and was setting things right in the business and getting things. And there was the great fire, the Chicago fire that had swept through. He lost his business, he lost everything. And so was, he had contacted his family, they boarded a ship to come from England to meet him uh, and uh, that they were going to try to figure out what life would look like going forward, where they would live, what would happen. And as they sailed over to come to America, that ship struck an iceberg and uh, many were lost and in that number was, was his family. And so here he's lost his business, he's lost all of his family and he's sailing back to England to be with his, uh, the family that he was born into and his, his other siblings and cousins and aunts and uncles and to have the funeral there. And as he's sailing uh, out across the waters, the captain points out to him the place where the ship struck the iceberg and where his family was lost, their permanent grave in these icy waters. And as he looked out over that, he began to pen this song. It is well, it is well with my soul. O Lord, haste the day when thy faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trumpet shall sound and the dead shall rise. Even so, it is well with my soul. What kind of life are you living? Is it a life that is anchored in peace? The truth that Jesus declares is that the message of peace of God is, is a message of us needing to reconcile with God and to come into full surrender. It is a war that needs to be waged before there is peace. And that war is one we're raging against God, not God against us. He is Lord, and we are fighting against it. We want to be Lord of our lives. We want to be in charge. And so I'd like to tell you that to get peace, you just need to find a quiet place, have a Starbucks coffee, just sip that and put headphones on, listen to your favorite music, and that's peace. But what I must tell you is what the Bible says that peace is. It's your surrender on God's terms to the battle that's raging against God. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. 
to fall on our face before God and say, you're God and I'm not. I want to make peace with you. Jesus says that the message of peace will cause division. Matthew chapter 10. Don't imagine that I've come to bring you peace on the earth. Jesus came to disrupt your normal. Jesus came to replace tolerance with truth confrontation. Jesus came to tear away the curtain of delusion. Jesus came to destroy the lie. Peace is what we long for, both internally and externally. God's peace enables us to navigate life in his, in his mercy and in His grace. He meets us exactly where we are. And He brings truth and hope and peace. I want to invite our worship team to come back. We crave inner peace, but we struggle to surrender to God. We want that peace, but we want it on our terms. And so we want to go to the table and say, okay, God, now we can talk. And uh, here's a few things, concessions we're willing to make. What do you bring to the table? God says, it's not enough. I want all. You must give up everything. You're not the winner. I am. <laughs> I'm the one who ultimately will win the battle that's raging in your heart and life. That's right. And so if you come here, you need to come to surrender. On my terms. True peace comes with surrendering our lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And so our question is, are we trying to keep the peace? Or are we ready to make peace with God? Are we struggling to try to keep the peace and do the things that we think will measure up and bear enough weight of goodness that God would find favor? Or are we, as Isaiah said, all of my righteousness is like a pile of filthy rags I dare not even bring it into your presence, God. I only come here with one little white flag to say, I surrender all. I surrender all. I want to ask you to stand with me this morning. God has been directing this service all along and leading, and I do believe that this is a place for surrender for some today. It's a time for us to come to God's table and say, I surrender all. I give everything to you, Lord. In times past, I've, I've made that confession, but I haven't really followed through with it in the actions of my life. I've held on to some things. I've, I've harbored some things that I thought were precious. And today is the day of surrender. I really want to make peace with God. And so I want to invite you as they come to sing, I want to invite you to come forward and I want to pray with you. I want to agree with you that today is a day of full and complete surrender. We're not going back to picking those things back up, but we're saying, God, I'm making peace with you today on your terms, waving that surrender flag and saying, I want to belong to you. I want that peace that passes all understanding, that kind of peace that will anchor me in my life no matter what storms or things are raging around me. Yes. Yes. And so as they sing, would you come, if God's tugging at your heart, let's make peace with God. Just stand across the front here.